warm welcome to everyone we'll go live in the next one minute i can see that already we have more than 40 clients joining here we'll wait for a minute more Thank you everyone for joining us today. I can see that it's 3.32 and we are already two minutes into the session. A warm welcome to everyone again. Uh, we have over 200 clients who registered for this webinar today. I'll quickly put up my screen and open the session. Thank you again. We are here today to welcome all of you to the People Risk Report Finding and Summary by Masama's Benefits Team. Uh, this webinar we will today run on managing people's side of the risk story. We are hosting this event in collaboration with Parima, and we'll talk more about Parima as we go along from here. I am Praval Karita. I lead Masama's Benefits Team in India. In context of the webinar here, we will today talk about it for you know, a host of risk that we have identified globally, which uh, post pandemic, all of us have seen emerging. And this particular study that we at Masama's Benefits today undertook, in fact, it has called out many top risks that we continue to see across the whole world. And more so in Asia, these are the five key risks that has been called out. Starting with health and safety, we all have seen how post pandemic, the entire workforce has relentlessly you know, worked to contribute to the success of every organization, demonstrated you know, huge resilience out there. And we today know therefore how the workforce has been exhausted. And at the same time, there is demand for more. So we have therefore seen how health and safety has now become a boardroom subject for every organization out there in the world and more so in Asia and in India. We have also seen how mental health has deteriorated with the lockdown and continued work from home environment. And therefore, today, mental health is sitting as one more area of concern for most organizations as we speak. We understand that non-communicable health condition as well as communicable health condition continue to be on top of the chart in terms of health and safety concern. I think 
if i have to call out one area of risk that stands out in asia that's talent practice when the entire growth story in asia unfolds most organizations today are concerned about how they retain attract and engage that talent more so in a phase where most of us continue to work from home and while organizations are planning to get the workforce back into the workplace but at the same time a larger part of the workforce will continue to remain engaged with us remotely we have mr harshvendra soen who is the uh, chief people officer of tech mahindra who will speak elaborately about the talent practice and how do we see that as a emerging area of risk and how do we manage that we also understand that travel and mobility is a challenge and therefore how do we engage our employees in today's world remains a challenge next moving on from there we do see that digitization has also its own risk in out there in terms of digitization and the accelerated digitization that post covid we have seen in the world we understand that cyber security or data privacy today are coming out as a stronger risk and in asia also we have seen over 40 50% of the corporates have identified this as a important area of work for them we do understand that how do i align how do we align the hr and the business strategy with the accelerated digitization story out there we need to understand that overall hr technology has largely been obsolete and therefore how do we pick up the momentum on using the right kind of hr technology to manage this we have chris blues who is the co-founder of darwin he will talk about how do we use hr technology to engage our workforce and do more moving on from there i think overall while in terms of probability it's a low probability but at the same time if we look at how the world is now into have and have nots we do understand that social unrest is a potential cause of concern for almost all organizations and at the same time we have to look at how the labor and employee relationship also unfolds in many parts of asia including in india and while the probability of something happening in those areas is low relatively low but the severity if anything happens is very high and therefore most risk managers across asia has ranked environment related and social related risk fairly high in terms of exposure at the same time most companies are also looking at how to make their workforce more equitable how to make their overall health and benefit programs more inclusive and that that's one of the area of work that has been you know there for some time now across all companies while we look at all these elements of risk we also need to understand that governance and financial risk continues to be one of the most important area of work for all risk managers and also the hr community with pandemic impacting with covid impacting all of us for last 18 months we have seen that how overall the cost of buying protection risk or the cost of buying health risk has really really escalated i think medical inflation was always in the single digit zone for quite some time now but now we have seen that medical inflation has actually accelerated to a double digit score out there and therefore to balance cost and care cost and empathy is something that most of us will go back and understand more from the panel today at the same time the overall legal and compliance framework in the country has evolved rapidly and in most parts of asia including in india today the regulators are more active than ever before because everybody is looking at how to protect policy holders interest how to protect employees interest and therefore the legal and compliance side of the world also has become fairly complex i think this is also something as a risk manager most of the risk managers are also worried about and therefore want us to focus more on with this i'd like to quickly formally introduce you to the panelists that we have here today uh, we have harshvendra soen as we spoke about in the last 2 minutes he is the global chief people officer and head of marketing for tech mahindra mr harshvendra soen interestingly also has led the business for tech mahindra in canada he was the country leader for canada in tech mahindra therefore he has won multiple hats as he has progressed in his career and we are privileged to have him here with us to as a part of the panel we have john kohler who is the apac regional leader for masamas benefits john today manages employee health and benefit business for masamas across 14 different countries in the asia and pacific region we are privileged again to have her here with us chris who is the co-founder of darwin and darwin is an enterprise that mercer acquired in the year of 2016 and chris has posed that led and helped us unlock more growth from darwin globally chris is part of our masamas benefits team now and he is heading the darwin as a business proposition besides many other roles that he plays i also welcome sony shrivastav today 
Sony is the board member at Parima. She also leads the India chapter of Parima. She is otherwise the head and head of corporate insurance, director and head of corporate insurance for entire APAC in Deutsche Bank. She will moderate the session. She will therefore from here take over and she will present you more about Parima and afterwards kick off the panel discussion. A warm welcome to all the audience here and warm welcome to all the panelists and Sony out here. Thank you so much for joining us today and we'll continue from here. Thanks. Over to you, Sony. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Praval, for such a wonderful introduction and for also setting the context for us. I just wanted to briefly introduce Parima uh, to everybody. Parima is basically the Pan-Asian Risk and Insurance Management Association. So we are basically a non-for-profit association that believes in strengthening the cause of risk management to create a very robust culture uh, to propagate and make uh, you know, uh, education and awareness possible uh, for risk management and insurance. And the membership of Parima is basically open to anybody who manages the risk and insurance for their organization. Now, Tava, uh, if you could go to the next slide. So who can be a member of Parima? As long as you're managing a risk for your organization, whether it's business continuity, whether it's cyber IT, whether it's people's risk from the HR side, whether it's internal audit or controls or ERM, Parima welcomes you. And uh, you can uh, you know, get to the membership just by applying on the Parima site. The membership is exclusive for risk managers only, and it's free for risk managers. So we really welcome you all. Travel, if you could go to the next slide. So as a risk manager, I believe the biggest risk that you know a risk manager runs is not learning and not growing. And the uh, basic fundamental ideas of Parima are to you know make sure that you know we have access to the best practices. So we engage with the best minds in the industry, and you know that includes both our insurance partners and also uh, the risk partners and the risk managers. Last year, we had about 30 different webinars on a variety of subjects from supply chain risks to geopolitical risk to captive solutions uh, to the hardening market, uh, a wide variety of cyber risk uh, discussions as well, how the pandemic is affecting risk in organizations. So it was a broad spectrum of ideas. One of the key uh, conference that we have, which is you know our showcase conference, is the Resilience Week. And last year we had over 2,000 registrations. Uh, there were, uh, you know, about 18 global and regional CEOs who came to present their point of view on a lot of engaging topics uh, over five days. And this year also we are going to be doing the Resilience Week, which is uh, happening in October. So I really urge all of you, Raval, if you could go to the next slide, which gives a bit of details on the Resilience Week that is coming up. You can register for the Parima membership and you, you can then register for the Resilience Week. Uh, access to the Resilience Week is also free for all Parima members. So please do join us uh, you know, for a lot of engaging discussions uh, happening over 25th to 29th of October. You can choose the sessions you wish to join, uh, but you know, this is going to be a very engaging discussion for everyone. So look forward to having more Indian risk managers on the Parima platform. Uh, we do have a bit of a missing voice of India on this. There are over more than 2,400 risk managers, but you know, from the India side, we have a very low participation. And I look forward to having a lot more of you there at, so that you can share your best practices and be the voice uh, of Indian risk managers there as well. So thank you so much for letting me give you a little bit of idea on Parima. And I think we can go into our panel discussion now. So before the panel discussion, I thought we should just sort of do a small audience poll. And uh, if you could, uh, Niladri, put up the poll for us. To do the poll, uh, it's pretty simple. You can scan the QR code through your phones or you can log into www.menti.com and you can enter the code, which will give you a direct access uh, to the poll. Can we go to the first question? Oh, just a quick check on how everyone's feeling today on a Friday afternoon. I'm hoping to see very good as the answers. 
oh, very stressed. Oh, it's Friday. It's kind of gonna get better. Well, that's wonderful to get a lot of responses. So this is the next poll that we have. We just want to understand from the Indian risk managers, where do you think the biggest risks lie in order of priority? You have a few more seconds before the poll closes and we would really like to see your views on this. Interesting to see that health and safety and financial is almost neck to neck. Just a few more seconds, if anybody needs to drop in their vote. So we can see that health and safety is the number one concern right now closely followed by financial and governance with environmental and social and digitalization and talent practice coming very close to them. So let me, you know, then start my questions and I would first want to start off with Joan. Uh, Joan, first, let me congratulate you on getting the Elite 2021 uh, award. Uh, you're pretty much of a tailblazer and, you know, for all of us women in insurance and congratulations on that. Thank you so uh, much. Let, so you saw how our risk managers rated the risk. Uh, I want, you know, to understand from you, from your point of view of your experience across Asia, what you think are the top three defining risks as far as people risks are concerned. Yeah, thanks, Sony. Um, and, you know, really delighted to be here with obviously our Indian colleagues and our Indian clients and risk managers across India in such a distinguished, um, you know, panel, um, you know, so hoping to, to have a really robust conversation, um, you know, in terms of um, obviously the people risk. Um, I, I thought it was quite interesting in terms of what the Indian, um, I guess, um, poll results had showed the fact that health and safety was first and then governance was second and talent practices were actually the fifth or rather the last in terms of the five pillars, because it's actually quite contrary to the, 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 the opposite in terms of what HR managers and risk managers have found out to be, um, you know, from across Asia. From a top three risk perspective, talent attraction, retention and engagement was actually number one. Um, and especially pertinent, I think, you know, given the war for talent and certainly around the future workforce. The second was cybersecurity and uh, followed very closely around data privacy, which I see the fact that, you know, accelerated digitization was actually fourth, um, you know, ranked from, from an India perspective. I think regardless of the circumstances, you know, the war for talent has certainly been ongoing, right, and particularly for Asia. You know, skills are, you know, effectively scarce resource, um, you know, competition is rife. So a lot of organizations really use benchmarking as an initial starting point, um, you know, in terms of figuring out what benefit matters to the employees. And, you know, in my viewpoint, certainly while they are useful, it's a lot of backward looking, um, you know, so it's important that you use things such as focus groups, surveys, uh, you know, demographic analysis to really design plans that are fit for purpose, uh, you know, make them relevant, make them meaningful for employees. Um, employees value learning and development, um, you know, career building, uh, the culture of care. Uh, you know, employers pr should probably also focus on flexible or choice benefits to bring about that flexibility and diversity towards the workforce. Coming to cybersecurity and data privacy, I think this has certainly exacerbated since the pandemic, uh, you know, with the whole work from home policies, 
that obviously do not have, I guess, the same rigor as being in an office environment, right? Um, but also, I think, around workforce exhaustion, which obviously drives a lot of higher error rates, um, you know, leaving a lot of the back door open, uh, you know, for cyber breaches and, and data breaches. Training, again, is really important for organizations to tackle this, but I think also having a, you know, uniform standard digital platform uh, to ensure consistent standards, you know, automation of processes, uh, you know, and so on. So, you know, it'll be interesting to hear, you know, what Chris later on talks about it, but I think, you know, having something like a uniform uh, single instance digital tool like Darwin, for example, you know, that not only engages employees, but also ensures that consistent standards of protection, you know, administration protocol and so on, uh, you know, are, are really important uh, in order to ensure that you're tracking and mitigating, uh, you know, some of these people risk aspects. Wonderful. That was such a comprehensive, you know, uh, overview of what you think are the top risks. And uh, Harsh, I'd like to, you know, uh, take the question to you. You saw that, you know, uh, health and safety was the number one, and it's on top of, you know, the Indian risk manager's mind. Now, when, you know, uh, we talk about uh, now that the pandemic is sort of opening and, you know, people are calling back employees, uh, there is a lot of concern on, you know, setting the right protocols, having a correct work, a return to work strategy. And considering that, you know, you are the global people's officer and, uh, you know, you are leading this in you know, so many different geographies. What has been your experience like, you know, because uh, the standards in, a, in one particular geography is going to be very different from another, depending on the situation there. So how do you perceive and what is your strategy, you know, to combat any liability and risk, uh, you know, keeping the employees health and safety paramount in the mind when you are call, doing a return from work strategy? Thanks. Uh, thanks, Oni, and lovely to be here. And I can only assure John that you know, talent has become really a hot property this part of the world. And um, we are in a terrible war uh, of talent, uh, you know, in, in, across industries. But coming specifically to your question, Sony, and I, that's, a, that's a brilliant one. You know, from a new normal or a post-pandemic perspective, uh, holistic well-being, psychological safety, and purposefulness have emerged as really key. Uh, to set the context, there are a few non-negotiables that we see in the new normal or what I call the now normal. One is of course, as I said, holistic well-being, which is not physical because most of us did, you know, constantly look at the physical well-being in the past, but it's more emotional and mental well-being, which has really taken center stage. Psychological safety, I already talked about, but hyper-personalization has taken over beyond the employee, beyond the workplace, and beyond office hours. Today, well-being is not considered only when you are in the office timings or office environment, or you know, because you're a virtual world. Uh, resilient org design, and I, I refer to gig workers. You know, for us, for example, there is a huge amount of workforce, which is gig workers. And the challenge of really uh, back to work, and I'll address your specific question on that, uh, is really even more profound in this case. And, and of course, we've clearly seen that purposefulness is what is driving people and not only brands. We clearly see upskilling, reskilling as an essential uh, part for success and workplace optionality, which really is work from anywhere, is, is a reality across industries. Um, our ideology has changed from return to work to return to anywhere, work from anywhere, right? So that's a big shift that has happened for an IT organization like ours. Uh, companies have actually witnessed a considerable increase in productivity uh, and cost. Obviously it's come with a, with a price, and you know, there is burnout and there is stress, fatigue, uh, et cetera. But most of uh, companies, especially in our industry, if you see, have all uh, delivered results which have never happened before. Uh, what is important to note, Sony, and this is for my panelists too, is that the return to work strategy is only a subset of what we call work from anywhere. So it's not the disparate uh, things, 
it is a subset, right? And that's the first thing. Secondly, when we talk about return to work, it is very specific to geographies, very specific to sectors. And therefore, there is no one size fit all, even for our company. We are in 115 countries, 140,000 associates. Uh, so we don't have one strategy. So we have to take into account what is the reality, keeping in mind geographies and keeping in mind the sectors uh, that we are in. Uh, obviously, what's important is that there are some logical things that you follow when you do return to work. So we are also doing the same uh, at TechM. One is, of course, only fully vaccinated uh, associates are allowed or uh, welcome back to work. Uh, masks and social distancing are a norm, even though the number of cases have gone down to almost zero. Uh, we have used technology uh, extensively uh, during COVID, and we have a patented um, diagnostic tool for COVID, which is 99% accurate. And it's just a prick. But <clears throat> because it's run through an AI tool, and it has database of millions of users, what it does is the accuracy of that tool, and it, we do it for all our employees. We also do it, you know, we now used it for many other uh, customers of ours, but the accuracy is 99%, uh, uh, whether yeah. you know, you're COVID uh, positive or not. And then that's, that's a big relief because when people come back to work, you know, what we have to be very careful is one case, and that's all we need to really have a, a panic situation. So, so I think really, we have to look at work from anywhere as a sustainable model, even when we talk about return to work. And what we have to live and make successful is this new normal. Fantastic. It was very interesting to hear about how you're using AI. And you know, that brings me to, you know, my subject, you know, of concern. And I want to take that to Chris. Uh, Chris, uh, you know, Harsha then talked about the now normal. And the now normal is that, you know, when, you know, as he says that it's a return to work to anywhere, you are going to be seeing hybrid models where people, you know, some of them are back to office and some of them uh, are still working from home. And the home atmosphere is such an uncontrolled atmosphere or uh, it could be anywhere. And, you know, you're working in uncontrolled atmosphere and you've seen that, you know, uh, you've seen cyber security become a big concern over the last year with cyber attacks going up significantly. So how do you envision, how do we create a good employee experience? Uh, and, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, in, uh, try and push back any of the fallbacks of the disruption, whether it's cyber attacks or social engineering uh, and those kind of concerns on the IT security side. So your views on that. Uh, well, look, hello, hello, everybody. And um, uh, delighted to be part of this panel. I. Uh, I've been in HR tech for 25 years, and right now is by far the most exciting time that we've had. Um, the, um, the acceleration in the last sort of 18 months towards a totally different workforce and ways of working that are, are really sort of digitally empowered um, is extraordinary. And, and Harsh, I, I, I loved what you just talked about uh, um, uh, and the way you sort of described it's, it's, um, uh, this, uh, this new movement. And I, I think... Um, uh, if I look at the last 25 years and what it, uh, where it started, which was that it was all around the physical borders that companies were able to put around the, um, the physical locations that they had. And, uh, and so that sort of the, um, the technology infrastructure is all around what happened when someone's sitting at their desk at the office. Um, I was technology was was very functional, so it's about how do I have a user manual that will train me on using that technology that is in my office, and we've seen a sort of a gradual move towards um, this this uh, always on. So many people would complain about or talk about sort of presenteeism was a big issue that I was um, expected to reply to emails at 9 30, 10 o'clock at night over the weekend, and. Um, uh, but I'm still working physically from my office. And actually what's now happened as a consequence of the pandemic is that we are in a situation where, um, where we are working from anywhere, as Harsh described it. I'm sitting in a hotel at the moment and, um, and that's not, uh, an unusual, um, not unusual for people to be able to sort of join in. So therefore, 
technology has got to do two things. One is technology has got to be secure around the individual user as opposed to the tech got to be intuitive enough that people are able to manuals without training. Um, and, um, and that way it reduces the risks of mistakes being made, which particularly for those of us in the, uh, in the HR, the people world, is really, really important. But also because if technology is easy to use, then it drives up engagement and it drives up productivity. So uh, big, huge, big, big, big sort of trends that were happening anyway have just been accelerated over this last 18 months. And what I found particularly interesting is the amount of uh, organizations I'm talking to who've now set up specific teams that are focused on, uh, on how within organizations they're able to change the digital landscape to be built around the employee and the experiences of the employee, no matter where they are. Fantastic. Thank you for that insight. And uh, uh, I think we are up for another poll question at this stage. So to access the poll question, please use the QR code. You can scan this through your phone camera or you can go to www.menti.com and you can enter the code as given on the slide. Interesting, interesting answers. So we do see a lot of people who say that, yes, they are concerned about mental health the same way that they're concerned about physical, but you do see a lot of people also saying that, you know, there does there is a scope for improvement and there is, you know, uh, difficult how to understand and access and have these conversations. So John, let me take the question to you. Uh, Mental health is still a difficult topic as far as Asia is concerned. It's not something that people easily talk about. People don't want to talk about it, you know, especially employees don't want to talk much about it, thinking that they might, you know, might get a concern that people, uh, that it's affecting the productivity. Uh, so it's still a topic of stigma. It's still a topic of uh, taboo. How do we go about normalizing these uh, conversations? What strategies do you think that you know organizations can use to sort of make this a more normal conversation so that they can actually start spotting signs early on before things uh, you know become far more severe? Uh, so any thoughts and uh, views on that? You're asking my favorite soapbox question. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, I feel, I think if you had asked this maybe two, three years ago, you find a lot of people talking about it, not doing anything about it. You know, it's a buzzword, you know, it's a nice to have. Yes, it's important, but, you know, I think there are other areas that we need to focus on. And so we'll come to mental health, um, you know, I guess when, when, we, when we've got the time and we've got the opportunity, when we've got the investment dollars, right? And I, I thought that the the, the 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 polls that we had there earlier was quite interesting because are we addressing mental health the same way that we're addressing in physical health and i guess i was a bit heartened that you know our our clients um you know colleagues in india feels that yes but still a lot more work to be done because i think that there is actually a fallacy in terms of addressing that the same way that we do with with physical health um you know people ask how are you today but they don't ask how are you doing mentally today, for example? I mean, I think that's a really great question to ask. And I've started to doing quite a bit of that already, um, you know, with my team, with my clients, um, and, and just kind of taking a moment and actually asking, you know, people how they're feeling, um, you know, mentally. And look, I think, you know, Sony, the pandemic has really opened up the Pandora's box, right? Organizations, insurance companies, CEOs, 
they've all stared down mental health, um, you know, and I think they've now clearly realized it's not a buzzword. Um, and it's also not an easy fix, you know, it's, it's not going to go away. It's a culture and a duty of care, um, you know, and it starts from the top of the organization. But it also really involves an entire industry, um, you know, and a movement to accept it and really deliver on the commitment to normalize mental health and not make it a taboo, to, to your point. It's a journey just like any other, um, you know, and I think when companies started realizing, for example, when they needed to invest in more preventative measures, right, the same way that they do, you know, why not do the same thing with mental health? I think if we all agree that prevention is better than cure and we actually do spend you know money in ensuring that we have preventative measures including things like health screening then why not mental health right so i think the tide actually has changed um you know but i do feel that you know this is one area that i sincerely hope uh, you know and, and harsh had mentioned about the new normal that this is the new normal that does not go back right that this is something that we continue carrying on the conversation we continue to focus on it and we don't wave it away that okay we've been there done that let's focus on traveling let's focus on you know building you know what have you etc one of the key things that I do think that we need to address is, you know, grassroots support, right, from the school, from families to corporations to political support to really normalize this. Ensure support to cover mental health is needed. And how many times, you know, have we seen an insurance policy, both outpatient and inpatient, where there is no mandated cover, uh, you know, for mental health? Uh, or where there is, it is a pittance of an amount, um, you know, or, for example, it's an optional cover with a higher premium because we are uh, we are afraid of a higher take up rate. What about the reverse, right? You know, what if you if you remove mental health because it is mandated, we're going to increase your premiums, you know, wouldn't that be a fantastic, you know, uh, uh, you know, reverse angle to look into that. Last but not least, I also think it's, you know, it's communication it's acceptance, it's vulnerability of leaders, um, you know, whether they are CEOs, uh, you know, team leaders or managers, talking about the struggle, encouraging support groups, uh, you know, extension to family members, including children, right? Uh, that really makes it stick, that makes it normal. And I'll give you a really personal example, you know, our family, um, you know, kind of use, we, we use therapists, uh, you know, we had to deal with a very difficult topic, you know, um, you know, bullying of our, of our child, um, you know, a couple of years ago, and we realized that it was actually quite hard for us to deal with. And, you know, we brought in a therapist. We had in, you know, we had a psychiatrist come to the house, talk to my child, talk to us, uh, you know, figure out a way to how to, to deal with this because it was weighing on, you know, our child emotionally, but it was also weighing on us as parents emotionally. So I think, you know, and, and I spoke about this, you know, quite a bit towards my, my circle of friends and also within my organization, because I thought it was important that, you know, as a community, we kind of rally to it, you know, we embrace what is needed, you know, the cultural change, the industry change, perception change, and that really is going to be the impetus to really drive this, um, you know, as a core business imperative. Thank you, John. I, I think it's really powerful when, you know, a leader like you makes a statement about this being completely okay to, you know, look after yourself mentally and to seek help and support when you, you know, think that you need a mental support as well. Uh, and if, you know, this is a tone at the top, I think it makes it much more easier uh, for people to sort of connect to that and say, it's okay for me to seek help as well. And, you know, even Harsh mentioned that, you know, psychological safety is also very, very paramount. But uh, Pravel, coming to you, uh, you know, a lot of people are now asking that, you know, are you okay? Are you mentally okay? But when they hear the answer, no, I'm not, then it's a big question mark, what do I do next? So what are the strategies that, you know, an organization can use to try and mitigate this? And, uh, you know, is insurance also a solution to this entire uh, issue? Yes, sir. So I think first of all, let me give a silver lining out there. Uh, I think way back in 2017, India passed the Mental Health Care Act. And as a result of that, we see today a very inclusive program in Indian health insurance context, where mental health is given equal status as to physical health. However, the fallacy out there is that mental health in an inpatient condition is covered. However, mental health in outpatient is not covered. It's also more to do with the fact that in India, 
across all spectrum of clients I have worked with now. Inpatient hospitalization is what is the core program. There's very little focus on outpatient care. And given the fact that the hospitalization program, we are always call it the hospitalization program rather than a health insurance program. That's the fallacy. So one, we continue to advocate to all clients that yes, uh, please also consider covering things around mental health care with respect to outpatient care. Because if tomorrow we talk about covering mental health and we don't actually cover the cost of counseling sessions, cost of employing a psychiatrist and anything else related, unless and until the person actually goes to hospital, which is almost at the very acute stage, I think it's a cover there, but not there. So that's point one. Secondly, Sony, I'll say one more thing uh, about the fact that uh, most organizations, if they are not investing in building the outpatient care ecosystem for mental health and other stuff, then maybe it's a time for them to invest beyond EAP. I think age old traditional practice had been to have an EAP line and we do a lot of work on mental health. I think those days are gone. I think organizations are realizing it and I'm happy to say that most clients I interact today with they resonate with this and they understand that the life has to be beyond EAP and life has to be more about meaningful work around mental health. So we continue to engage to our consulting team, healthcare consulting team with clients, to look at more areas of engagement there. Thirdly, Sony, uh, again, I'll say it's a fallacy and more of all of us here to respond to. Uh, if you look into health insurance wording and Sony, I know that you are a uh, you know, risk manager and therefore you'd be very you know, familiar with it. All health insurance contract doesn't cover substance abuse. Now, if I don't cover substance abuse, but at the same time, I say that I take care of mental health and we know how much depression, substance abuse, all of this can be tomorrow correlated. Therefore, I have seen personally so many claims being denied out there, though the patient is actually suffering from a mental health care situation. And yet, because you know, he or she has a history of substance abuse, the claim goes for a toss and the claim is not payable. Now, how do I really give solace to a family that we are there to support you, but yet we are not there. I think those are questions that I you know, leave some thoughts with the audience also. Uh, important work for all of us as benefit advocates, as well as for clients to look at. And most importantly, the risk management community to look at. Absolutely. I think, you know, as far as the Indian insurance uh, industry and, you know, the wordings as far as hospitalization and the kind of coverages uh, that are available, I think we do have a long way to go. But uh, I mean, it's, it's a good step that, you know, people are talking about it. There is yes. going to be mounted pressure on, you know, including this. So uh, great insight. Um, Harsh, let me, you know, take this back to you. Um, you talked about the war for talent. Uh, and, you know, it is, uh, talent practice has come up as one of the, you know, top concerns as far as people, this is concerned. Uh, there is a need to sort of de-skill or upskill for the future workplace. But the reality also is that, you know, you have a lot of workplace exhaustion. So how do you navigate both of this? How do you encourage and engage employees, uh, you know, to take steps to retrain and to, you know, retain these uh, talent? So over to you on that. Well, thanks, uh, Sonia. A very complex question, and I'll try and answer this by quoting Winston Churchill, and that's my favorite quote to my learning and development team. And Winston Churchill said, I'm always ready to learn, although I do not always like being taught. <laughs> and, and the problem in our upskilling and reskilling is exactly that. Because if we package upskilling and reskilling as a need, it will add to the exhaustion of the employees. So the idea really is, to build it as a culture, as a business imperative. And, and that's where the challenge is because now we are looking at building a culture where we want to de-link as a necessity, but more as a motivator. Uh, a couple of things that we've seen in the learning and development space recently. One, we've observed that skills are more important than degrees. And, 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 and the mood is changing. It's not fully there yet. Uh, you know, but we, have, we were always in this part of the world hung up with what is your qualification and which degree do you hold. At least for us at Tech Mahindra, we moved away from that almost completely and said, what do you bring to the table? Not what you have studied. That's the first thing. And the second thing, which is our, also our employee value proposition is the freedom to explore. Freedom to explore your own career 
and then choose your path to that career, which means it's like a Coke machine model where you mix your own drink and really choose your own career path and then upskill yourselves uh, and reskill yourselves to achieve your career dream. So it's not that we are herding you into a room leading to the exhaustion of just being in the same room as 100 other people in the post-pandemic scenario, uh, but really letting you choose where you want to go. Now, it's also about how do we make learning and development and upskilling attractive. At Tech Mahindra, we have a career acceleration policy and to answer what you just asked specifically, we encourage our associates to upskill themselves on a newer skill or a niche skill. And what we say is that if you are actually able to bill yourself at a higher rate, and that's the only way we measure, nothing to do with number of hours of training, et cetera, we will give you up to 20% increase in your salary. Now, what happens is suddenly we have a lot of excitement where people do want to grow, uh, do want to upskill. So that's, it's a huge benefit for the employee, but for the customers, it's a massive benefit because now they have niche skill trained people. And for the organization that is TechM, obviously, we are at the cutting edge of technology only if we have number of people upskilled and reskilled. So it's become a business reality, a business paradigm, right? Rather than uh, you know being led only by HR and L&D team, because if you have to maintain learning and development as a culture, in my opinion, cannot be led by HR and learning and development. They can be facilitated but it's the business that has to be leading it and wanting it. Sorry for the long answer, but, but that's a reality. No, that's a fantastic insight as to, you know, how you build in the incentives uh, for people to want to do better for themselves and their own careers. So thank you very much for that. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is that I never let my schooling interfere with my education. So, you know, it's pretty much like that. It's, it's what you bring to the table as far as your skill is concerned. Uh, that really stands you apart. Uh, John, let me ask you, you know, uh, there has been, uh, when they talk about, uh, you know, working from home, flexible working, everybody said this is going to be quite a bit of a boon to push, you know, the diversity and, you know, a lot more women are going to look forward to having, you know, more flexible hours. But what we actually saw last year in the pandemic and, you know, the global numbers uh, as well show mm -hmm. that, four times more women dropped out of the workplace uh, than men. And this sort of, you know, so, uh, is more towards the fact that usually it is the woman who's the primary caregiver uh, with no access to childcare, children, you know, studying from home, being the primary caregiver for the elderly, uh, no support as far as, you know, home is concerned. Uh, we do see that a lot more women have, you know, sort of left the workplace than men. And this sort of has pushed back a bit of the diversity agenda as well, where, you know, organizations are working really hard uh, to ensure that they have, you know, talented women in the workplace. Uh, how do you think, you know, uh, organizations can build a strategy to, you know, giving it a lot more impetus now that, you know, we've seen the scenario? Yeah, it's, it's really sad that um, obviously women have been impacted, um, you know, based on what you've just mentioned, right? And I think it's not just obviously in India, but it's all across, as you're pointing out. They are the main primary caregiver. If the fact that there is, uh, you know, work from home or study from home, for example, home-based learning, it's always the mother, not often, I don't want to be also sexist in this case, but, you know, there's always generally... Uh, you know, the parent, the, 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 the mom generally, you know, has to be the one who actually has to look after, uh, you know, the situations and whatnot. And, and I think, you know, companies can probably help themselves by indicating that, you know, in, in the context of the war for talent, right? The fact that you have such a large portion and such a significant portion of your workforce leaving the workforce and not having an avenue to come back, I think is just, you know, it's just a crime. So if there are ways that we can try and make things like flexible working hours, flexible working practices, uh, you know, part time to some extent, um, relevance or, or, or I guess, you know, um, examples around like the gig working, um, you know, and, and that kind of level of flexibility. I think that goes a long way in terms of addressing the fact that, you know, the on demand workforce of allowing that level of flexibility. Uh, you know, to cater towards um, obviously the working women and 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 all, all father for that matter, right? Uh, that requires that. 
Um, and you know, diversity, gender equality, you know, it's it's really it's good for business. You know, it's good for your employees. You know, it encourages innovation. Uh, you know, diversity of thought. Uh, you know, winning ideas, um, obviously new business, you know, improve morale, improve productivity. If everybody in the room kind of looks like the same, you know, thinks the same, behaves the same, then where is originality of idea, right? Um, and that's also not a democracy either, you know. Um, the, the Indian workforce is, is a very young, dynamic workforce. And I don't think that generally the workforce will actually keep quiet if they do see the inequality. And you know it's also a very mobile, in-demand, you know, globally workforce, right? So I think if the you know if we're not keeping up with the need of diversity, of putting up minimum standards of benefits, uh, of offering flexible working practices, you know, minimum quotas of of things like gender and diversity equality, uh, you know, you'll find that we're going to be losing talent, right? And so you find that you know companies will also start, I think, losing their brand reputation and finding hard to retain, let alone. Uh, you know, attract talent. So, look, I, I realize it is, you know, easier said than done. Um, I think companies do need to address those key points that we just mentioned. Um, you know, and I think the broader framework of ESG, right, environmental, social, corporate governance, uh, you know, in areas such as community, climate change, uh, you know, diversity, to your point, you know, these are really important, um, you know, to attract and, and obviously engage a more socially conscious workforce at the end of the day you know we we put a lot of stock around benchmarking uh you know best practices around benefits and salary compensation which is great but let's also take a look at benchmark around how do we benchmark things like flexible working uh you know use that as a foundation um you know to build our understanding um you know of what the benefits uh you know should be and then make sure that we are aligning it right around our diversity of our workforce and obviously our mission and our vision. Uh, you know, I think we need to keep ourselves honest, uh, you know, create things like, you know, a separate committee, you know, answerable either to the board, uh, you know, or, you know, even in our company, by the way, we have a set of ESG or DEI influences, uh, you know, who will and actually can drive about sustainable change and they call out, you know, call a thing a thing and they call out. Uh, you know, some of these uh, inequitable, um, you know, practices. So, you know, make sure that we we do, you know, have that aspect and, and make it personable, relevant, uh, and, and obviously engaging. At the end of the day, Sony, we don't have to figure it out ourselves. You know, companies don't have to go it alone. You know, if you can use an external consultant, uh, you know, to support you on these goals, uh, you know, whether it's diversity or climate change or what have you, uh, you know, what gets measured gets done. You know, so I think you need to make sure that you publish your commitment, uh, you know, to, to the demographics, I mean, on the demographics, on the diversity goals, uh, ensure that your compensation and benefit practices obviously align to these goals, uh, you know, and, and really embark on this step by step. Uh, you know, it's, it's a journey just like anything else. Fabulous. I think that's a really, you know, critical takeaway that you have to start measuring your indexes as far as, you know, diversity is concerned and it has to be a boardroom conversation. Yeah. Uh, Harsh, I, I want to ask you from the organization point of view, how do you go about, you know, making sure that uh, diversity is a boardroom topic? How do you go about creating a strategy to make sure that, you know, all the diverse needs of all the diverse employees are met and, you know, there is a, a room for everyone on the table? Uh, thanks for that uh, important question, Sony, and, and I, I echo what uh, John said, but but let me give you a perspective. Um, Tech Mahindra, we are at 100, and 100 plus countries, 135 nationalities, uh, 140,000 employees. Uh, for us, it is not really a choice. If we have to be successful, uh, we, but we don't want this to happen by chance. At Tech Mahindra, we, have, we call ourselves an intentionally diverse and a globally inclusive company. And we are very proud of that. Uh, we are now the number one company in diversity and initiative and for women to work in India and in Asia now. Uh, and we are also investing a lot to make this, and we are very proud to say we make this a big business differentiator. The way we are approaching diversity and inclusivity, in my mind, Joan, I think the, the only difference I would say is diversity still companies are doing, but inclusivity is actually a lot more important. And the way we approach it is we call it human experiences. And we don't call it employee engagement. We don't call it employee experience. We call it the human experiences. 
And we believe that we use technology while technology is an enabler, movements of truth are still human. And therefore, we are, we are trying to develop an organization that uh, is diverse and inclusive and uses a high tech approach, but to deliver a high touch culture. Uh, clearly, you know, as far as the pandemic is concerned, while it's a social calamity, it's actually been good for diversity and inclusivity. Uh, it's actually the, the diversity and inclusivity have been an unintended beneficiary because today, even a company like ours goes to all parts of the world, whether it's in India, tier one, tier two, tier three towns, whether it is near shore countries, uh, because it's all virtual. Uh, secondly, gig workers. We have our own platform called BGIG. Uh, we have 100,000 people almost, uh, uh, which we are aspiring to register on that. Uh, now, basically, with tools like this, you know, it is a lot more inclusive culture. Uh, whether you've taken a break or whether you want to work two hours a day, uh, I've, we have seen during the pandemic, our diversity, uh, gender diversity specifically, has gone up significantly. We are, by the way, a company where our majority of associates are millennials. We have about a 35% gender diversity. Uh, but having said that, I think what's important is the balancing act. Uh, and we do it, uh, again, I repeat, as a business differentiator. We pitch it as a business differentiator even to our clients and customers. Now, some of the things that we've done uh, reasonably okay is uh, or concentrate on women-centric policy. And, and people say, why? Uh, because I believe it's affirmative action. And we have decided to say that we will take affirmative action and we will have uh, you know, women-centric policies. Uh, we will have LGBTQ policies. We have 12 active work groups uh, and, and all our offices are gender uh, neutral. We have gender neutral washrooms. Uh, and we are very proud to say that we have gone well beyond what most companies do. I talked about the gig working platform. We have sabbatical policies for various reasons, uh, you know, uh, uh, for various needs. Uh, we have especially done a lot of work around uh, wellness. And I think to me, to be a great, and this, this pandemic has brought uh, a rare opportunity where, you know, companies have the opportunity to become great, not because they have a big brand only, but because they care truly for their associates and employees. They have a chance to become great, not because they make a lot of revenue and EBITDA, but I think they have a chance to become great because they showcase beyond themselves to the communities and take care of the diversity, uh, diverse and inclusive needs of the company. And I'll end by quoting uh, Verna Myers, and, and I've always quoted her saying, that diversity is being invited to the party, but inclusivity is being asked to dance. And I think it's time that our companies really ask each other to dance. That's fantastic. That's, you know, it's so good to hear uh, the kind of effort that has been put in. And, you know, very few companies actually realize the rewards of those efforts and how this is going to be, as you said, the main differentiator when, you know, you, you are facing your customers and you're facing, uh, you know, uh, your general reputation in the market. Uh, I think kudos to you and what you've been able to achieve. Uh, having said that, uh, Praval, I want to direct the next question to you. Uh, and this is on, you know, the topic that uh, uh, people said is the second biggest risk, which is the governance and financial. And increasingly, you know, a lot of people are getting very concerned about the cost of care. For the cost of concern and we've seen you know uh, that the cost of insurance has gone up uh, alongside that there is also a lot of demand that you know you have maybe not necessarily equal benefits but equitable benefits so it is going to be you know different people wanting different things uh, not one size fits all and how does the cost of you know giving high-end benefits or you know cutting-edge benefits uh, showing that level of empathy because now organizations want to brand themselves as empathetic organizations. It's not necessarily that, you know, they give the best compensation 
or they have the best perks. It's more about how, you know, how much empathy is an organization showing towards its employees. So the whole idea of, you know, uh, the benefits that you provide, the personalization of benefits that you provide and the associated costs and insurance benefits, what is your view on this and how do you see the market behaving? So I think you said it all. There is a good balancing act that all companies and all the risk managers and stakeholders like us has to play between care, empathy, and cost. I think we already spoke about the fact that medical inflation is in double digits. We are also witnessing an unprecedented situation where term life insurance, which is one of the most important element of the entire risk management side of the world in employee benefit, uh, has shoot up like anything, more because the insurance market doesn't have capacity to offer. So likewise, we have therefore seen that overall, are the, you know, if I say cost, that would be wrong. Overall investment in health and benefit has increased and rightfully so. Uh, if you look at today in the uh, ACR risk report also, we have seen how talent, retaining and attracting talent has come to the forefront and is identified as one of the most important risks. In this audience poll itself, we saw how health and well-being is actually top of the chart. So if you go to Asia or if you come to India in any part of the world today, health and well-being, attracting and retaining talent is top priority. So therefore, rather than looking at all these elements as cost, we should look at these as investment, investment that go back and you know, help our employees grow, help our employees have more faith in the organization and beyond. At the same time, Sony, while this can be short term, in the medium to long term, I think we need to look at how to shift cost from on an employer-centric model to an employee-centric model. So we talk about flex benefits and we are very passionate at Marsama's benefits about flex, not just in India, across the globe and uh, one of the largest advocate of you know, going into flex benefit. Flex, flex benefit does enable organization to move from defined benefit to defined contribution. And, and that's, that's a model that we need to look at in the long run. At the same time, co-funding some of the important areas of insurance, like for example, voluntary parents policy or a top-up policy, co-funding and co-funding by employer can be another strategy out there, if not flex. So a mix and match of some of these strategies are important. I'd also like to quickly take a view from Chris here. Chris, uh, you have seen how flex benefits has evolved globally and now Darwin is there to support clients to look at flex in a very holistic way. And in fact, Darwin does much, much more beyond flex. So Chris, and I'll also pick up the point that Harjvedra mentioned uh, how, how even diversity and inclusivity is driven through technology. So Chris, how do you look at this? The entire investment that companies should do on its chart and what should be expected there? Yeah, you know, I, um, uh, I rolled out what I think was the first global flexible benefit program back in 2003. And, um, uh, and so I've seen the world change dramatically in how it thinks about flexible benefits. And I'm going to get back to, to um, actually sort of bring in the last topic, if, if I can, of, of sort of where Joan and Harsh were going around um, uh, human. And because I think that if I go back over the last of 10, 20 years, it was about the corporate and the workers. And I think now it's about humans. And I think there's increasingly um, a recognition by companies that it's not just about the rhetoric and talking about how we care for our employees, what a great company it is. We are, it's actually now about really demonstrating and really making a difference because if the talk is just talk, um, people will realize it and uh, and and therefore the uh, people realize that the company's fake it's not really um, uh, it's not it's, it's not authentic it's not really caring about the employees and what they're doing and so over the last 20 years we've seen this huge shift as there's been a, a recognition by companies that actually just providing a one-size-fits-all approach to benefits simply doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work for, for two reasons. It doesn't work because uh, the company is wasting a whole load of money on employees who don't value the benefits which are being provided by one size fits all approach. And it doesn't work because you've got a whole load of employees who actually want the company to be providing support to them and their needs and where they are on their own life journeys and, and whatever else. Uh, but the company isn't, isn't doing that. So I think that sort of has been sort of the big driver towards providing um, uh, more choice and flexibility for employees. So the providing um, uh, th these personalized benefits that, that really make a difference. And at the same time, what we've also seen is 
the growth of technology, not just in the benefit space, but across the whole HR space. And a recognition that the technology that employees need to use needs to be personalized and needs to be consumer grade. So I should be able to interact with my work tools in the same way that I interact with my, uh, my consumer tools. Um, I'm not gonna be able to make educated choices around my benefits unless I'm educated on what those benefits are. And the choices, which often can be quite complicated, can be made really, really easy to understand. But um, so I think that sort of covers flexible benefits, but actually benefit technology itself has grown hugely in its use. So whilst a lot of our, our clients have got um, flexible benefit programs, actually a lot of our clients just use technology in order to run their benefits. And it's because um, uh, they want to make sure employees have a really great experience in onboarding and utilizing their benefits. They want to make sure that the administration is automated and, um, uh, and that therefore, um, uh, mistakes aren't made and they can be it's, it's super efficient in, in how they're run and also if benefits are automated then it reduces the amount of risk in running benefits and benefits have got some of the most sensitive data that's out there but then and then and then the fourth thing is is around um data and benefits are one of the biggest expenses that an organization has and uh, and increasingly there is an understanding by the c-suite and by hr that they need to have data to understand what people are doing, how people are engaging, and um, and how costs are changing, and I think you, you mentioned um, uh, copay could be you know if we implement copay, what what impact does that have on the benefit program? And organisations need data to be able to understand what's happening, and also to be able to benchmark against uh, everyone else. So hopefully that sort of gives I, I guess a, a bit of a flavour as to both how I've seen the, the world changing and and the, the role that technology has to play uh, in it. Thank you so much, Chris. That was very insightful, and I really appreciate your uh, feedback here and your input here. I'd like to quickly go to Sony here. Sony, I know that you are the moderator, and you are, you know, asking us these questions about so many insightful subjects. But you yourself uh, actually, you know, manage entire risk and insurance program for Deutsche Bank across APAC, and you therefore buy insurance almost every day, just like us. Uh, I'd like to ask this question in terms of the outlook of a risk manager, outlook of a corporate when they buy risk pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, how do you see that changing? And how do you see therefore the overall governance and financials uh, shifting dynamics between pre-pandemic and today? And then what's the outlook for future at the same time, Sony? So you're flipping this, Braval. I don't <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so uh, yes, you know, the conversations are changing. And you know, the pandemic has really, I think, forced everybody to go back to the drawing board and I think every organization has probably looked at the benefits that they're providing, uh, you know, where they are right now, what they need to do. Uh, conversations that used to be very common two years ago, how much of a maternity benefit is at 50,000 or 75,000 is no longer, you know, a part of the conversation. It's more on the critical issues uh, of how best can you support employees. Um, but there is also the cost factor and the sustainability factor. And I think, you know, uh, for organizations to really be able to make a sustainable uh, plan that has empathy, there are, you know, a strategy needs to be across three points. One, what you can provide. Two, what you can assist. And three, what you can facilitate. So let me give you an example. When you're talking about provide, it's about what employee benefits are you providing your employees? And the crisis made everybody relook at that. But again, the view that you need to take, the reaction that you need to do in the crisis is very different from a post-crisis scenario. So your view on what benefits you're providing has to be a long-term view. There will be short-term uh, you know, crisis help that you might need to give your employees. But in the design of the employee benefits, it's always better to take a long-term view. What we also saw is that, you know, employees reach out to uh, companies for assistance. And this could, you know, a lot of companies did put in, you know, emergency helplines, uh, you know, to assist people as far as hospitalization or ambulance is concerned. So it's important for, uh, you know, an organization to figure out how it can assist employees whether it's your EAP providers, whether, whether it's an emergency response provider, uh, whether it's an insurance broker, 
uh, whether it's you know tele consultations that most people want so there is an entire batch of you know uh, benefits that you can assist an employee with and third and most importantly everybody is concerned about insurance now and as an organization you have far more leverage than what an individual employee does so what can you facilitate for the employee uh, going forward we saw that you know a lot of organizations a lot of countries uh, and we see this across countries are looking very closely at voluntary plans whether people want to do a top up for themselves or the people want to include parents and this is a conversation that you know you need to have uh, with you know say your insurance broker because they can actually analyze what your demography is what your insurance uh, you know benefits have been claimed your claims uh, over the years that trending what do your employees need and what can you facilitate so if you have the correct balance between what you provide what you assist and what you facilitate this can be a far more sustainable program uh, in that sense thank so, you so much sir Thanks. I hope that answers Absolutely. your question. Absolutely, Sony. It was very important to have a risk manager point of view here. So I thought I'll flip the question and go back into you. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you so much. And I, I think we're pretty much, you know, towards the end of our discussions. But I just want, you know, to ask Harsh uh, to give his closing remarks, and then maybe Joan and Chris, maybe you can just add. Well, I think uh, you know. Uh, thank you, and it was very, very insightful, and I love the conversation we had. But just uh, to, to, to continue for what you said and Pravel said, you know, I'll give you an example. When we talk about diversity, inclusivity, and we talk about, and I'll take insurance because that's the topic today. You know, how many companies really have insurance from same, for same-sex partners? You know, it, it, it is, it is, you have to live it uh, truly. Uh, and when we introduced it some, some months ago and some years ago, actually, uh, it, was, it, was, it was unique. But, you know, imagine... On one side, you're talking about diversity and inclusivity, and the other side, uh, you know, you're not really taking it down to every single aspect of your organization. The second thing I would say is that all of us as professionals have a role today, and, and that includes the organization, which are really beyond the self or beyond the organization into the communities and countries. And I think if it's about time that uh, industries rose up to the occasion and said, you know, we will look beyond ourselves. We will look within communities. We will look within our uh, countries and other countries and say how we can actually uh, ensure success. So, so great opportunity for all of us. But thank you for having me here for this conversation. It was wonderful to have you here, Joan. Your remarks, please. Thanks, Sony. Um, again, you know, I think there's been really a great, wonderful discourse, um, you know, from our, from our, from our, obviously our panelists here, but also I, I was, you know, messaging some of the questions that were asked here. I, I, I genuinely hope that one of the key takeaways that we take away from this, you know, um, panel session is that it's a community, right? It's, it's, it doesn't just, it's not just one person, but it's community. Um, and I think that, you know, when you look at and identifying those five pillars of risk, right, they, they do resonate and they have impact in organizations in, in very different ways. And so if you do come across, and I know that we're all very competitive, we like to benchmark, we like to be the best, we like to be number one, you know, and, and all of that. But in certain other areas, and, you know, Harsh made it really quite clear, if we feel very passionate about having inclusive benefits and having a much more broader wording around certain policies. If there are areas championing mental health, for example, that we need to be included into um, insurance policies and what have you, then as a community of peers, right, rally together to, to ensure that we establish that, um, I guess, you know, whether it's, you know, lobby and, and whatnot in terms of getting either regulation or policy changes um, and whatnot, because it has a positive impact uh, you know, for the community at large. And I think that's something that, you know, we as insurance brokers or insurance consultants together with, you know, our clients, you know, as a community, we can facilitate those dialogues and facilitate the conversations. You know, you are not one, right? You are not alone. And so when we are pulling that collectively, we are 500 companies coming together, big, small, large, championing that cause to the insurance market to say we want this to be changed we want this to be addressed and powerful things can happen and so that would be my takeaway and that would be my hope that you know as we leave this we can think about 
how do we then collectively make that movement happen, um, you know, for India and hopefully for the greater good. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, John. Chris, any last words from you? Yeah, look, I, I, um, I again, I've, I've, it's been great to hear from my fellow panelists on on this really interesting topic. And we've talked about people risk, and obviously, risk is about risk and reward. And so, whilst we focused a lot here on um, uh, on on what the potential challenges are, I really think that you could flip everything we've talked about to be about the opportunity that is presented to organizations by focusing on some of the things that we've talked about here and how it can make organizations stronger. So get it wrong, downside risk, but actually this is really about the reward and opportunity companies have got. Fabulous. Praval, I will now hand it over to you if you can, you know, want to take the question answers from the audience. Thank you everyone. Thank you for a wonderfully engaging discussion here. Thank you so much to all the panelists and my colleagues here who could you know, enable us to go live today uh, on a, such an interesting subject. I would now request my colleagues to unmute the lines in case anybody want to have any questions from live at us. Uh, we have already answered most of the Q&A on the tab out there. But if anybody would like to ask us any questions, uh, we can unmute the lines. My colleagues will unmute the lines immediately. You can just raise your hand and then somebody will unmute your line. I can see that Steve Tunstall has raised a hand. Uh, Nidadji, would you like to quickly unmute him and get the spotlight on him? I just think he asked us to post the link for Parima. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry, sir. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I also saw. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. I also saw uh, Nikhil Agarwal had raised a hand. Nikhil, would you like to come live and? Yeah, hi, Nikhil. Good morning. Uh, Nikhil, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so my question is to uh, Joanne, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, with respect to, you know, your inclusive, uh, you know, approach towards mental health and, you know, uh, your entire family, you know, getting, uh, you know, tested uh, by a psychiatrist. So how do you feel that, you know, it needs to be taken to the employees at large? Because I think employees uh, somewhere, you know, are uh, very hesitant to bring this out and if you know if we can have that inclusive approach uh, you know towards employees i would say a lot of uh, conflicts would be resolved you know before it gets you know to the uh, you know actual working environment yeah so, so nikhil th that's a really great point right and and that's why i think you know in the mention that i pointed out earlier i think when you think about benefits, right, and particularly around that mental health support, for example, um, very often employers think about it in the lens of the employee, and I will subsidize, I will pay, I will cover 100% for the employee, right? And but very often, you know, the challenge, the stress, the frustration, um, you know, sometimes is home related, it's, you know, it's because of your child, it's because of your spouse, it's because of, you know, extended family, and, and I think, you know, the reality is, is that just like you would with medical cover where extensions are provided for dependents, right, more and more companies are now starting to pivot and offer that inclusivity, particularly from a mental health perspective, um, you know, first the coverage and care um, extended for immediate family members. So very often I find spouse and children, yes, that they, that, that extension coverage is offered but not so much around, obviously, um, you know, grandparents and whatnot. But I, I think at least that's that's a step in the right direction. The second aspect, I think, is is awareness, um, you know, and, and inculcating that whole culture of care and awareness beyond just employees, but also into that family members, right? So, you know, at Marsh, um, you know, I am actually quite happy to say that we launched this whole first responders, um, you know, to mental health, and we taught a whole bunch of people at the workplace around how to spot someone who could be struggling. And then taking that further to say, well, sometimes it doesn't, it's not just at the workplace, but you know, what happens at home, for example, and then extending that outside and, and broader, uh, you know, to the family, um, you know, and, and making sure that they are also included. So again, 
It, it is. It, it involves a lot of obviously um, investments, not just from a from a monetary perspective, but also I think around time. Um, you know, but I do genuinely think that as organizations kind of tinkle through and, and look, we're, we're going to not always get it right. Right. And, and I think Chris said it quite well. It's about human and it's about thinking that a lot broader. And I think that genuinely is the right direction. And people can genuinely feel that you may not have all the answers, but I get that you are trying and I, and I get that you are trying to make it work. And I think that really, really does count for a lot. Thank, thank you. I'd like to request the audience once again, if you have any questions, we have 10 minutes more. We can certainly continue even after that. If you have any questions, please raise your hand. Great. So I, I don't see any raised hands, so I'll take this as a conclusion here. Uh, I'd like to once again, Acknowledge and thank you so much for all the audience, to all the audience out there who participated today in this session. I'd like to extend a warm thanks to the entire panelists here. Sony, thank you so much for hosting and anchoring this event. And Mr. Harjvendra Sain, uh, Chris, Joan, thanks to all of you for joining us today afternoon. Have a good Friday all ahead. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.